You know, um, I'm going to back up a little bit to the first verse of the second chapter. You know, we talk about uh, this is a scripture that I wore out as a young Christian. I don't know if any of you had a struggle with sin after you got saved, <laughs> but I definitely did. I, uh, I didn't understand what had taken place inside me. I didn't understand that the sinful nature had been cut off and severed in my life. I didn't understand that Jesus took care of the sinful nature on the cross. You know, I knew I was saved. I knew I was born again. I knew I was different. There was a change that had taken place. But I didn't understand how to walk with God. I didn't understand how it worked. And nobody else did either. <laughs> you know? Uh, and I just, you know, I got tired of failing and falling and, and sinning. And, 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 and you just become exasperated with it after a while. You know, and you become discouraged when you're a, when you're a baby Christian, when you when you want to serve God, and you and you see what the Word of God says, and and uh, you know that you're a new creature, and 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 you're the righteousness of God, but yet you keep stumbling and fumbling and failing and feeling guilty and inferior, and you know the enemy's right there to taunt you, you know, and and you. So, you know, I, I wore these verses out, man. And I, I was very sin conscious. I, I was taught, you know, that I wasn't a sinner anymore, but yet I kept sinning. You know, because there's a, there's a, you know, there's a teaching, and there's a little church right beside where I live, and they still hold to this doctrine. And this doctrine is, is, is incorrect. This doctrine teaches that you're saved, and then there's a second work of grace that takes place. It's called sanctification. Now, I'm not going to mention the little church by my house because I love these people and I wouldn't want to offend them if they happen. I'm not going to point them out. But this, this, this teaching of a second act of grace is something that was embraced by the Methodist. And I'm not talking about a Methodist church right now. It was, em, it was embraced by the Methodist movement back in the 1800s. And it was that you would get saved and then you would pray enough and spend enough time in God's Word to where you actually had another work that was done in your life called sanctification. And then after that, you wouldn't have any more problem with sin. Well, I can tell you right now that that is wrong. Amen. Amen. That is wrong. Yeah. And anybody that's deceived, not only are you wrong but you're deceived if you think that you're sanctified enough to where you don't have a problem with sin anymore I can just look in the New Testament and, and God's dealing with the church and, and I look over there in the book of Revelation where Jesus is dealing with the church they had a whole lot of problem with sin in the church so obviously they didn't go through that second act of grace well you know it isn't an instantaneous thing but yet it is an instantaneous thing. You know, because Paul called the church at Corinth saints. And yet he called them carnal. And walk as mere men. In other words, you don't look any different from the world. Division, strife, envy. You know, those kind of things operating, that's not love and that's not maturity, that's carnality. So, but he called them saints. And he, and he told them that they were redeemed. He told them that they were sanctified. He told them that they were justified. You know, he told them that. But see, so there's a position of holiness that we have in Christ where you are holy. When you get born again, you're holy. When you get born again, you're righteous. When you get born again, you become the temple of God. You know? But there's also a process that takes place. 
and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. So there's actually a process of holiness. Now, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews in the 10th chapter, it says we are sanctified once for all by the offering of the body of Jesus. Okay, so there's a once and for all sanctification that takes place when you're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And you become a child of God. And you have a legal standing in heaven, but there's also a process that takes place with Christ in you, the hope of glory. But you have to teach people how to access this grace by faith. That's what it says in the book of Romans, isn't it? So we have to access this grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So we have to access this grace, it, but it's a finished work. See, that's the whole thing about the teaching of the finished work of Christ in order it's already done. You're not trying to talk God into doing anything. You're coming into the presence and receiving grace to help. To help you in your walk. And when you understand that your relationship between the law and the Lord, that's how you access when you understand that your relationship to sin is over. Now see, what the enemy wants you to do is he wants you to keep thinking that you are, you know, you just have to sin. You, you know, you, you can't help but sin. You know, Brother Swagger talks about sinning every day. And, and so he wants to convince you that you're no different that you're the same person that you used to be. Nothing's changed. You know, and he'll send you feelings. You know, sometimes when I get up in the morning, I don't, I don't feel holy. How many of you always feel holy when you wake up in the morning? Never trust your feelings when you wake up in the morning. It takes a while. Maybe a cup of coffee. And you know, I, I, I've even had feelings to the contrary for an extended period of time. How many of you have ever felt like that before? I know you have, Sister Carolyn. You know, and what the enemy does, he comes with thoughts. He comes and he tries to convince people, you know, well, you've done it this time. How many of you have ever heard that? Oh, you've done, done that one too many times. You know, that's it. I remember an old saint of God. I could call her name, but I'm not. Back in 1979, came up to me. I'd, I'd been struggling. I was a teenager. I'd been struggling, you know, with the world. And, and I was immature. And I, was, I didn't understand grace. But I knew I loved the Lord. And I knew something had happened to me, miraculous. And this old saint, when I came back into church, when was on we just moved to Texas Street over there. And this old saint came up to me now. You're back in the fold now, but don't keep going. Don't keep falling. Don't keep messing up because, you know, the Lord will turn you over to a reprobate mind. What's something to tell a baby Christian? The things you remember. What does the Bible say about people that's turned over to a reprobate mind? When they no longer acknowledge God. They didn't want to have anything to do with God whatsoever at all. Here this little fledgling man or young man's trying his best, struggling, not understanding, immature, and yet somebody kick the props out from under him and make him scared. Thank God it didn't make me give up. I can't do this. You know what I'm saying? I just couldn't. See, Further on in the book it says, He that's begotten of God sinneth not or cannot commit or cannot live a lifestyle of sin is what it's talking about. <coughs> it says his seed remaineth in him 
and he cannot live a lifestyle of sin because he's born of God. So even though I was stumbling and falling and, and, and failing and, and just couldn't get my act together, the grace of God was there and he kept teaching me. Amen. He kept reaching out to me. Thank God Sister Francis and Brother Allen didn't give up. I didn't give up. I just kept pressing. I kept seeking. If you're struggling in your life, if you have an area in your life that you don't have the victory in, not coming to him is the wrong answer. God doesn't mark our sins. That's what it says. If he marked our sins, who could stand? I love that picture where Jesus is holding that guy under his armpits like this, holding him up, and, and the guy's got a hammer in his hand and a spike in the other hand. You know, our sins nailed him to the cross, but he still loved us. He still came. God still sent him. Now, see, I'm not justifying living wrong. You understand that? Because I'm going to tell you, I didn't want to live wrong. I wanted to live in victory. God made us to be victorious and to always triumph in Christ. I mean, and when you're not walking there, it, is, it, it can be discouraging. But then you take off that sweat-drenched garment. And you know, you came to the realization that you can't do this on your own. See, you're either married to the law or you're married to Christ. Yeah. See, but the water is muddied in most Christian circles. Because they're afraid to speak anything about the law because they don't want to be sacrilegious. I never forget I had somebody come to my house one time. They was going to straighten me out on grace. And uh, they've been well versed in the law and how, you know, what we were supposed to do. And I sat them, they sat down. I said, now, you can't use the Gospels because Jesus was under the law. And, and you can't use the Old Testament. This is a New Testament. They had no ammo. And I said something about you don't have to go to church on Saturday. And you don't have to keep the law to be righteous. And when I said that, I thought they were going to fall over backwards. Keeping the law don't make you righteous. Never did. Why? Because the law has no life in it. It's called the law of sin and death. Amen. It points it out, but it don't do anything to it. Exactly right. Kenneth S. Weiss has a quote I love, and I used to quote it all the time when I was younger, and I didn't understand it, though, because I read some of Kenneth S. Weiss' teaching. And I quit reading it because he embraced the doctrine of once saved, always saved. What I should have done was stayed in that book, ignored the once saved, always saved doctrine, and stuck with the doctrine of grace, living in victory over sin. But see, a lot of times we throw the baby out with the bathwater. And we don't have as much sense as an old cow to eat the hay and leave the sticks. And so we just discount, I discounted it and I shouldn't have, it was a mistake. You know, we have to be careful about false doctrine. You know, I remember when I was in Bible school, Brother Hagin gave us a, a book, and I can't remember what, it was glossolalia, it was about tongues. And Brother Hagin said, okay, one chapter in this book is good. The rest of it's garbage. And he told us, have as much sense as an old cow, eat the hay and leave the sticks. Don't pay any attention to anything other than this one chapter, because the rest of it's error. Well, he trusted us. You know, he trusted us to be able to, to glean through that. And that's what we have, that's what I should have done as a youngster. But I didn't. So God had to come in through another avenue and teach me grace. And it took him a long time to get through this thick head of mine. Because I'm going to tell you, it's a whole lot easier to learn something than it is to unlearn it. Once you've embraced false doctrine... And I'm going to just be honest with you. The law never gave life to anything. 
And it took me forever to figure that out. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. He's not talking about natural human physical life. We already had that. He's not talking about money and riches. And that's what a lot of people, oh, you know, life more abundant, man. Blessings, you know, provision. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about life. The breath of God. Now, you receive the breath of God whenever you were born again. But there's another continual breathing of the Spirit on your life to enable you to walk in victory. Jesus didn't say, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. He said, I'm the bread that comes down from heaven. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You need divine impartation every day because your walk with God is just as supernatural as your experience when you were transferred out, translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Your, your life is supernatural. Your walk is supernatural. We walk by faith and not by sight. So it's believing God for his provision every day, staying in a place of trust and faith to where my sin was taken care of on the cross. My sinful nature was taken care of on the cross. Now the Bible says that sin dwells in the flesh. So the sinful nature is still in your flesh. But the Bible says you're dead to sin by the body of Christ. You are dead to sin. You are made free from sin. That's what the Bible says. I am free from sin. I am not under its power or sway. I don't have to sin. I don't ever have to sin again in my life. It's my choice. That's it. It's my choice now. Do I fail? Yeah, I do. And that's why this provision is made in the first verse of the second chapter, talking about Jesus being the propitiation for my sins, not for my sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And I have an advocate for the Father. Thank God when I do fail, I can go to him and confess my sin. But he can give me the victory so I can walk a victorious life. And I'm not bound by sin. I'm not captive of sin, the sinful nature. I can, you know, you think of yourself. A lot of people get, get, get uh, upset when you say this. If you do wrong, you know when you do wrong. Okay? Nobody has to tell you when you miss the mark. Okay? So what I'm saying here is not saying that you, sh you will never feel guilty about what you do wrong. But what I'm, I'm going to say is, how do you see yourself? How do you see yourself in Him? Do you see yourself as a son Do you see yourself righteous? Do you see God smiling on you? Or do you sense a frown from heaven? Are you conscious of your right standing with God? You know, are you guilt ridden all the time? Are you under condemnation? Do you feel a sense of doom? You know? And guilt. And regret. See, that's not the way he wants you to see yourself. Why? Because Jesus took your sins and mine and bore them away. He defeated sin on the cross. And in doing so, he could defeat death in his resurrection. That proves he, he defeated sin on the cross when he was resurrected. Isn't that what it says? He was delivered up for our offenses and were raised again for our justification or because of our justification. 
He paid the sin debt. In other words, you had a big debt you could never pay. And he paid it. He paid, he took care of your sins and the sin that bound you and the legal grounds by which the enemy was holding you in bondage. You don't think, uh, you don't think the devil's a legalist? You are wrong. Man, he keeps up with everything. Yeah, he knows how to be legal. Come around here and pray at these altars. You know, I, I can't remember the last time I sinned. That's good, though. That's a good thing. But I could come up around these altars at one time in my life. And I'd kneel down to pray, and the devil would remind me of every mistake I had made, every fault, every failure, every shortcoming. He would list them all for me. And by the time I got up from the altar, I was completely defeated because I didn't understand the finished work of Christ. Now, if I, if, if I sin and fall short, and I ask God to forgive me, that doesn't even come to my mind when I'm kneeling down here. You know why? He took my sins away. He cleansed me from all unrighteousness. I'm not conscious of that sin anymore. That's what it means to not be conscious of your sin. It doesn't mean you can live a lifestyle without condemn a lifestyle of sin without condemnation. Of course you're going to be under condemnation. You're going to be in the dark. Until you come and confess and repent, then you get back in the light again. You know, you, it's, it's, it's so wonderful. You know, the law having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image, can never with those sacrifices which they offered make the comers thereunto complete or perfect. For the worshipers once purged would have no more conscience of sin. That's what it says. So when you, when you come according to the finished work of Jesus and what he did and you receive it by faith, then you can come and have no conscience of your wrongdoing. Of course we all fail. Of course we fall short. And you're never going to be completely, totally free from the ability to sin until Jesus comes back and you receive your glorified body. Amen. And we're going to have to deal with people that, wrong, that, that do wrong. How many of you know that? How many of you figured out that you're going to have to deal with not just your sin, but the sins of everybody else? Because people are going to make mistakes and they're going to sin and they're going to fall short. And you know what? We don't need to have unreal. That's the thing about the law. When you're under the law, man, you're hard on everybody else. But you're easy on you. That's just the way it is, man. Whoo, man, you hold people to a bull, man, that's straight and narrow. Now. Now we're imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. An offering, a sweet-smelling savor. And it talks about be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. We're so much easier on people. Oh, I'll never forget. Man, back in 1988, Brother Swaggart fell. That was before he had the knowledge of the the, uh, the cross. And I want you to know they crucified him. They crucified him. Now, Brother Swaggart was hard on folks, too. He was tough. But I'm going to tell you something. There was a work of humility that took place in him. But, you know, this old boy never did criticize him. You know why? because I was in the same boat he was in. I started praying for him. You know why? Because I knew he had a gift and he had a calling and I didn't want to see him fall. I wanted to see him get back up again. And he did. And that's the way we ought to be. When we see people fail and fall short and fall, we don't need to criticize. Man, we need to encourage. We need to exhort one another daily. We need to sharpen one another. We need to, to make trim your wick and make you burn bright. That's why we come to church, to exhort one another, encourage one another, help one another, strengthen one another. 
You know what I'm saying? If somebody's got a problem, we don't need to beat them over the head. You know, there may be some extreme times when, when measures have to be taken. You wouldn't believe. Uh, you would be shocked. We don't have it here, but you wouldn't believe. I've talked to Brother John, and Brother John just absolutely astounds me at the politics that go on in the churches. At the, at the, at the maneuvering and, 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 and the underhandedness that people get involved in, in in the church. And it all boils down to power and money. You know what I'm saying? So, and Brother John don't talk to, about that much. He talks to me about it. But you got to be careful because people can become discouraged if they understand what's going on. Because people in the ministry are human beings too. They're human beings. They're just as frail as you are. They just have a gift and a calling. But I, I start, I, you know, I almost gave up teaching. You know why? Because the Bible says that teachers will be held to a higher standard and a greater judgment. And I was like, Lord, I think I want to quit teaching. <laughs> and he's like, nah, you ain't going to quit teaching. You know, the Bible says, If any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Lest ye also be tempted. Man, let me tell you what. That's a test. That's a test. You know, it's like, it's like hearing the word. If you hear the word... Affliction comes. Why? Because you have to be tested. The enemy has a right, once you hear the word, to test you on that word. And it's the same way when you, how you deal with the body of Christ in a crisis or a sin or a fault or a failure. You are going to be tested on how you handle that. The merciful obtain what? Mercy. Those that forgive obtain what? Oh, I'm telling you. There was somebody I knew that was in the ministry. They were a powerful, powerful person of God. And they, they fell. And I want you to know, I had somebody that wasn't in this church. It was another church I was going to years ago. And this person came to me. Uh, one of the presbyters of the church came to me. And they told me, they said, brother, this is what happened, you know. And, and let me tell you what, they were shaking. They were, they were trembling. And they said, I have to be very careful how I handle this situation because this man is a true man of God. He may have failed, he may have fallen, he may have sinned, but I know that he, God's got plans for this man. And I have to be very careful how I deal with him because I don't want to incur, incur, incur how do you pronounce it? Incur. <laughs> incur God's wrath on me. Because his man's a chosen vessel. And sure enough, man repented, got back in and doing a phenomenal work for God. Now, but this guy was like, ooh, you see, huh, what about David? What about Saul? Saul was anointed. Man, David would not touch him. I like something Brother Bill Johnson said. He said, once somebody's been born again, I'm very careful about how I treat them because even if they're not walking with God at the time, there's still a covenant there with God. That's right. We've got to be careful how we treat the body of Christ. It doesn't justify living in sin, and sometimes things have to be dealt with. Things, there has to be disciplinary action by the Lord. Sometimes the leadership has to take place, uh, take a step in discipline. But it's always done out of love. Paul, when he dealt with the person in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians, where the man had had taken his father's wife. It was his stepmother, and the, and the man took his father's wife. Paul had him excommunicated. 
But you read over there in 2 Corinthians, he told them you restore him, you forgive him, lest Satan get an advantage of us, us, uh, the whole church. So we're not justifying living in sin. You understand sometimes there has to be discipline, you know. And, and, and the Lord will, will and, I, and I was thinking about that this morning. You know, over in 1 Corinthians 11 chapter, it says, If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. See, now the Lord's chastening, the Lord's chastening of the church is different than his chastening of the world. The judgment that falls on the world is completely different than the judgment that falls on the church. Because he's seeking to bring you into repentance. And the, and the judgment of the world many times brings destruction. So that's why it's very important, you know, for us to understand what God is doing in the church through discipline. And we have to stay in love. And we have to listen to the Lord. So it's very important, you know, when we're dealing with sin. And we're going to have, like I said, we're going to have to deal with sin in the church. We're going to have to deal with sin in other people's lives and in our own lives. And get the victory. You know, and we get the victory. This is the victory that overcomes even our faith. That's what the Bible says. So it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of where you put your trust. You know, I'm not trusting in myself. I'm not trusting in my own power. I'm not trusting in my own strength, see? It's when you put your trust in Him. I can't do this, Lord. You know, that's what the children of Israel should have said. When they came out of Egypt, God gave the law. Did you know that not one person died when they came out of Egypt until they got to Mount Sinai? And they complained and griped the whole way. But there was no law given. Between the time they left Egypt until they came to Mount Sinai, not one person died. But when they received the law and they said, we'll do it. Man, I'd have, you know what I'd have said? I can't do this, Lord. I can't do it. But see, they thought they could. And they still think they can. And there's a lot of Christians that think they can. But I got news for you. You can't keep the law for righteousness. Because you never measure up. So what God does is he brings his nature and puts it inside of you. He breathes the breath of life into you. See, it's all about, John's gospel is all about life, light, love, and truth. That's what the gospel of John is all about. So when God breathes on you and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, you have his grace, you have his love, you have his mercy, and he keeps breathing on you. It's the breath of God. And he supernaturally enables you to walk in love and please him. Do I keep the law? Yeah. But not for righteousness sake. See, righteousness comes by faith in the finished work of Christ. I just naturally keep the law. I don't steal. I don't lie. I don't commit adultery. I don't kill. You know, I don't let other God, I don't, I don't have another God before me. I don't want to do those things. He wills and works in me that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Now, if I step out of love, and that's what you're doing when you sin. If I get out of love and I, and I get into darkness, I break my fellowship with the Lord, what do I do? I confess my sin, get back in fellowship with God, and keep right on walking with the Lord. Don't break a stride. Don't break a stride. When you sin, Father, forgive me. Forgive me, I've, I've, I've sinned. Fellowship restored. No begging, no pleading, no bargaining. How many of you ever tried to bargain with God? <laughs> Ain't no bargaining with God. It is what it is. Forgiveness, the sins of the whole world, your sins, 
They're already paid for. It's taken care of. Now, that doesn't mean I go out and live any old way. No, that just proves that you don't know him. It's my lifestyle. I like what one minister told me. I was talking to him. Oh, it's been 10, 11 years ago now. He said, Roger, don't let a snapshot determine your life. How many of you know what a Polaroid picture is? How many of you have ever had a Polaroid moment? <laughs> now, if they was to look at your whole life, and it had that one little Polaroid picture in there, what would they see? What's your whole life been like? Look at King David, his whole life, seeking God, trusting God, seeking God, Polaroid, seeking God, trusting God, trusting God, pleasing God. He didn't let that one Polaroid picture determine his whole destiny and purpose. So don't let a failure, a snapshot, determine your whole lifestyle. I got to quit on that. All right. Thank you so much for your attention.